hard to remember just how numbed and terrified people were in September of 2001. 9-11 happens, and then there's really kind of silence from the president for several days after that. And then comes this moment where he calls in a joint session of Congress to deliver this address specifically about 9-11 and how we're going to respond. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President pro tempore, members of Congress, and fellow Americans. In the normal course of events, presidents come to this chamber to report on the State of the Union. Tonight, no such report is needed. It has already been delivered by the American people. My fellow citizens, for the last nine days, the entire world has seen for itself the state of our union, and it is strong. In the beginning of the speech, he points to the emergency responders, he points to the police and firefighters. Um, he points to the uh, ordinary Americans uh, who intervened. And that, uh, I think, helped ground the speech uh, in the sort of concrete everyday lives that everybody across the country was just sort of awed by. We have seen it in the courage of passengers who rushed terrorists to save others on the ground. Passengers like an exceptional man named Todd Beamer. And would you please help me welcome his wife, Lisa Beamer, here tonight. One of the really good things about that speech is the use of concrete detail. We have seen the state of our union in the endurance of rescuers working past exhaustion. We've seen the unfurling of flags, the lighting of candles, the giving of blood the saying of prayers in English, Hebrew, and Arabic. Every one of those details creates specific visual images that people remember having seen. It resonates with them. America will never forget the sounds of our national anthem playing at Buckingham Palace, on the streets of Paris, and at Berlin's Brandenburg Gate. We will not forget South Korean children gathering to pray outside our embassy in Seoul or the prayers of sympathy offered at a mosque in Cairo. Part of how they decided to structure it was in a series of questions. Americans have many questions tonight. And this was Bush's first time, really, to explain to the country who did this. He had to explain who Al-Qaeda was, why they did it, and what we were going to do in response. Americans are asking, who attacked our country. The evidence we have gathered all points to a collection of loosely affiliated terrorist organizations known as Al-Qaeda. They are some of the murderers indicted for bombing American embassies in Tanzania and Kenya and are responsible for bombing the USS Cole. Al-Qaeda is to terror what the mafia is to crime, but its goal is not making money. Its goal is remaking the world and imposing its radical beliefs on people everywhere. The terrorists practice a fringe form of Islamic extremism that has been rejected by Muslim scholars and the vast majority of Muslim clerics, a fringe movement that perverts the peaceful teaching of Islam. This group and its leader, a person named Osama bin Laden, are linked to many other organizations in different countries. Part of what we all felt uh, at that time was a sense of uncertainty. And that was an example of President Bush uh, addressing that head on. Americans are asking, why do they hate us? They hate what they see right here in this chamber, a democratically elected government. Their leaders are self-appointed. They hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. They want to overthrow existing governments in many Muslim countries, such as Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. They want to drive Israel out of the Middle East. They want to drive Christians and Jews out of vast regions of Asia and Africa. These terrorists kill not merely to end lives, 
but to disrupt and end a way of life. With every atrocity, they hope that America grows fearful, retreating from the world and forsaking our friends. They stand against us because we stand in their way. We're not deceived by their pretenses to piety. We have seen their kind before. They are the heirs of all the murderous ideologies of the 20th century. By sacrificing human life to serve their radical visions, by abandoning every value except the will to power, they follow in the path of fascism, Nazism, and totalitarianism. And they will follow that path all the way to where it ends, in history's unmarked grave of discarded lies. Bush did was he not only talked about the tragedy, but then he cast it in a way that favored his political agenda um, and his foreign policy agenda. So it wasn't just that we were attacked by terrorists, we were, we, we, our freedom was attacked. Um, it wasn't just that uh, these terrorists hated us, they hated our freedoms. This was, in a sense, cast the attacks in a much bigger light. We all felt attacked, and I think, you know, it's that fight-or-flight response that kicks in sort of collectively where we say, look, you cannot do that. We will fight back. You attack us, we will fight back. The enemy of America is not our many Muslim friends. It is not our many Arab friends. Our enemy is a radical network of terrorists and every government that supports them. By aiding and abetting murder, the Taliban regime is committing murder. The Taliban must act and act immediately. They will hand over the terrorists or they will share in their fate. Give the United States full access to terrorist training camps so we can make sure they are no longer operating. These demands are not open to negotiation or discussion. At that moment, that's what people wanted to hear that somehow, some way, we were going to return the favor. No matter how it got delivered, we were not going to simply sit and let this go by. George Bush also varies his posture. You know, there are times he used to give speeches where he'd be leaning over the podium. and People would say, oh, he's a great kind of guy to have a beer with. That's why we, that's why we like him. Uh, but here, his, uh, his body language is solemn, appropriate to it. The guy who's going to fight back. Bush has these uh, sort of facial expressions that uh, often are uh, kind of laughable, but, but here um, they really make his point well. He has this thing that he does when he says something, his face moves forward and his brow gets a little furrowed. And if you watch this speech, you see those moments when the, that happens. It comes at those moments where he's saying, look, we know who you are. We're coming to get you and we will get you. And you can see that in his face very plain to see. Our war on terror begins with Al Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. And I think what the people gathered there in that joint session, the people across America watching on TV, they saw someone, they saw a leader that said, I am going to get vengeance for you. We are going to get justice and that is what we want. I believe it's Kubler-Ross who had come up with this theory about the five stages of grief. Uh, and much of what Bush said kind of led us through that, that as a nation, we are grieving, but we've moved from that grief to anger, and now we are resolute. It is primarily the president in moments of national crisis who defines how we're going to move forward through this tragedy. Americans are asking, how will we fight and win this war? We will direct every resource at our command, every means of diplomacy, every tool of intelligence, every instrument of law enforcement, every financial influence, and every necessary weapon of war to the disruption and to the defeat of the global terror network. When a president speaks to any audience, 
he or she is not only speaking to the people in the room, but the people watching on television, the much broader audience. That can sometimes be tricky to navigate. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Uh, a crucial moment where foreign policy, war policy, uh, we could have gone in any direction in response. And his speech says, this is the way we're going. This is how we as a country are moving. From this day forward, any nation that continues to harbor or support terrorism will be regarded by the United States as a hostile regime. Our nation has been put on notice. We're not immune from attack. We will take defensive measures against terrorism to protect Americans. This is not, however, just America's fight. And what is at stake is not just America's freedom. This is the world's fight. This is civilization's fight. This is the fight of all who believe in progress and pluralism, tolerance and freedom. Perhaps the NATO Charter reflects best the attitude of the world. An attack on one is an attack on all. Terror unanswered can not only bring down buildings, it can threaten the stability of legitimate governments. And you know what? We're not gonna allow it. People were unified, not, in our, not only in our sense of uh, who we were, but in our uh, unified about our president and the course that he was gonna take us in. People are also looking to the president for comfort in certain moments. Presidents can be something like a, a comforter in chief when there has been a terrible national tragedy. I know many citizens have fears tonight, and I ask you to be calm and resolute, even in the face of a continuing threat. I ask you to uphold the values of America and remember why so many have come here. We're in our fight for our principles, and our first responsibility is to live by them. I ask you to continue to support the victims of this tragedy with your contributions. The thousands of FBI agents who are now at work in this investigation may need your cooperation, and I ask you to give it. I ask for your patience with the delays and inconveniences that may accompany tighter security, and for your patience in what will be a long struggle. And finally, please continue praying for the victims of terror and their families, for those in uniform, and for our great country. Prayer has comforted us in sorrow and will help strengthen us for the journey ahead. In these times, it's, it's often effective to empower people, uh, make them realize we do have a choice. And he says some are talking about an age of terror. It is natural to wonder if America's future is one of fear. Some speak of an age of terror. I know there are struggles ahead and dangers to face. But we, we don't have to choose these things. We can choose um, uh, our own destiny. But this country will define our times, not be defined by them. As long as the United States of America is determined and strong, this will not be an age of terror. This will be an age of liberty here and across the world. The closing about how he has the shield of a New York City police officer that was given to him by the, uh, by the cop's mother really just gets right to the, the heart of all of it, that this is about the people. Some will carry memories of a face and a voice gone forever. And I will carry this. It is the police shield of a man named George Howard who died at the World Trade Center trying to save others. It was given to me by his mom, Arlene, as a proud memorial to her son. It is my reminder of lives that ended and a task that does not end. President Bush spoke to people's fears, but also explained the situation and pointed the way toward what we did in Afghanistan. There was massive national consensus uh, to go into Afghanistan, and this speech is one of the reasons why. The speech was used as an opportunity by Bush to sort of reformulate 
the basic tenets of American foreign policy. And I, I would argue that you could find a straight line between that speech um, and the, the decision to invade Iraq. In, in many ways, the, 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 the foundation for that decision was laid uh, in the context of that, of that address. Fellow citizens, we'll meet violence with patient justice, assured of the rightness of our cause, and confident of the victories to come. And all that lies before us, may God grant us wisdom, and may he watch over the United States of America. Thank you. In this speech, there were no false accusations. There was no false claims about weapons of mass destruction. There was no axis of evil. It went only as far as it needed to and no further. And that's why it was Bush's finest moment. I'm Charlton McElwain. Subscribe to Thinker. In Oklahoma City, this was the act of one hateful person. And Clinton came out to Oklahoma City to deliver it. And he had a variety of audiences, too. It was at a moment where his uh, personal popularity was, was low, and this was his moment.